Father, I, I thank you for the ability and the honor it is, it was, and it has been to just be with part of these people's lives. I thank you for what I've been able to see and how you have moved and how you have changed lives. Father, you have done amazing things since I've been here. And Father, I know you will continue to do so with Pastor Raymond and his team. And Father, I just pray that I can just give one last appeal to my church, to my family. And I pray that they can just see you lifted up high and lifted up. And you will draw them to yourself. This is my prayer. And this is my final request. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. So, funny story. So I would like to start with a story. I was at Southwestern Adventist University. And we were in the cafeteria. The food? It's all right. It's all right. We don't go for the food. We go for the fellowship. Amen. Amen. So we're at Southwest Adventist University, and it's my senior year. I'm about to wrap things up, um, just kind of like this. And my friend Samson, he's pastor in Oklahoma. I'm going to have the ability to work with him. We're going to go to the college campuses and just go nuts, uh, just act fools. I'm really excited to work with my friend Samson. But at this time, we were even crazier than before. And my friend Samson, he just read this text in Joel. He was studying it all night, and he has this vision like this. This new paradigm should be. He comes to the cafeteria and he guys, 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 guys. We've been acting like idiots all four years in college. But God can do something today. God can do what the impossible. All the things that we should have been doing all four years, God can restore to us today. And I kid you not, this is my man Samson. He gets on the table in the middle of the cafeteria, stands high and mighty, and he says, The Bible says. And Joel 2, 25. What is it? Can you go back? Give it a second. And The people of this world are looking for something. I don't know if you remember the city that they're going to be building, these fancy, like, suit, like, just out uh, of this world thing you see in TV shows. People actually have the money to do so, and people are looking, people are searching. If, if we come together as one, that if we seek Jesus as one church and one family, say one family church, if we do, God can do amazing things and people will come to us and they will be able to see the thing that they're seeking. They will be able to find the thing that they, they have been searching for their whole entire lives and we can show them that it's Jesus. Amen? This week, I wanted to, to take that and, and kind of go a different direction in part two of this series called We're Calling One Church, One Family. You see, we believe that Jesus is the answer, amen? We believe that God can do it, amen? Well, some of us believe. And I began, as I was listening to Pastor Raymond, I began to ask questions that I thought you might ask, and that I had also asked, and that I have asked, is God really able? I began to think, you know, can he really do it? That's a big claim that he can restore. Oh, it's, it's gone. But he can restore the things that we have lost. He can bring back which which has been stolen. He can do those very things. And I and I begin to say, that's a big claim for the brother to make. I mean, have you not seen my life, God? Have you not seen the things that have been stolen from me, that have been taken from me? You're telling me you could give it back to me twofold? It's a big claim to make. And I began to think, okay, if I have this thought, you probably have this thought. I mean, when we go back to the Garden of Eden, right, just take a step back in the Genesis, in the Genesis story, you know that Adam and Eve had two choices. They had the tree of life, but the tree of what? Everyone say it with me. One, two, three. You got two choices. So there is freedom of choice in the Garden of Eden. And in that garden, Adam and Eve, they chose that they wanted to be their own gods. 
and they took of the fruit, and they ate of the fruit, and in doing so, they aligned themselves with the king of darkness, the father of lies. And darkness was dispensed all throughout humanity. And it is clearly seen just in chapter 3, after they eat of it, I mean, Jesus comes onto the stage, and he's like, where are you? And I was like, I'm here, but I was afraid. Why are you afraid? Well, because of the woman you gave me. Right? I do like blaming women, but it's not good here, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. The woman you gave me. And the first time ever, Adam, Adam blames his wife and doesn't own up to his thing. And then Eve blames the serpent, but in reality, she's really blaming God, who allowed the serpent to be there. And then in chapter 4, you have a brother killing another brother. See, he was more willing to kill his brother than to offer up a sheep. The irony here. It's remarkable. You get all the way, uh, you continue through the Genesis story, and it gets so wicked that Dr. Chapman talked a little bit about us. He said he doesn't say it to his colleagues because, you know, whatever, but there is, there, have, there was a what? F-L-O-O-D? Everyone say flood. It was a flood. We believe that. And Dr. Chapman believes that. He's one of the very few. I hope you can attend his class. Last night was just profound. It was amazing. I love it. And, and you go throughout the story, and it seems that darkness is just overcome humanity. It's too dark. Like the woman at the well, the well is too deep. Then the man who had been sick for 30-something years, he says, I try to get into the pool, but someone always gets before me. And over and over again, you hear about how this darkness has just enslaved humanity. And it seems that there is no hope. Yeah, we have promises. Yeah, there are prophets who speak about the fact that dry bones can live again. But then when I look at my life, and when I look at yours, that's a big, big, claim, big claim to make. Are you with me? I think that's why I wanted my last sermon for the whole church to be on John chapter 11. You guys have your Bible, your phones. Go to John 11. I think that's why I wanted John 11. I was actually like half awake, half asleep, and I dreamt about Lazarus. And I was like, all right, God, if that's the one you want, let's do it. John 11. See, and we've been doing this series called Reflecting Our Bible in the Northeast Church. Some of you have seen it it's on Facebook and YouTube. Profound. I've had some great young people from the high school actually attend. I've had Gus. I've had, uh, I think, I think where is, is Javier here today? He was in it. So many people have been a part of Reflecting Our Bible over the last three years. Recently, Adrian's daughter came up with a book that we should study, Valerie. She said, let's study the book of John. It's her favorite book in the Bible, right? So we began studying it, and man, as I've been looking like really deep into the book of John, it's beautiful. You see, the book of John makes an audacious claim in the very beginning of its chapter, chapter 1. You see, do you guys remember the story when Jacob ran from Esau into the field, and he fell asleep on, the, on a rock, and he had a dream that angels were descending and ascending on a what? On a ladder? Jesus interprets that vision a little bit differently. Same message, but there is no more a ladder. Jesus is the ladder. He's saying, I'm the bridge. I am the very thing that is going to bring heaven down to earth. I'm the very thing that can, that can really make a difference. I am the ladder. I am not just the ladder. I'm not just the Messiah. I'm just not the Son of Man, but I am God in and all by myself. Are you with me? And so as you work through the stories of, of John, John has seven miracles that happen in the book of John. How many, everybody? Seven specific miracles. See, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they got a bunch. They just throw it out, like everyone. And then John's like, eh, I'll do it differently. All right? You got seven. The purpose of each miracle is to testify and to explain to everyone that this is no ordinary man. That when you look really closely, you will see his, hum his divinity flash through his humanity. Like Ellen White talks about in Desire of Ages. When you look closely, when you are really poor in spirit, when you are broken and you've got nowhere to go, that's when you will recognize who Jesus really is. Because you'll be seeking after him. And so there Jesus is, the first miracle to reveal the glory of God. You know what it was? At a party, turning water into what? Funny thing, huh? Jesus chooses to reveal who he is at a celebration. At a place where people are laughing, where people are dancing. Everyone say dancing Adventist. Come on, shake them hips, all right, girl? All right, here we go. Dancing, 
drinking wine. They were having a great time celebrating love and all that it entails. Here, at that point, Jesus chooses to reveal that he truly is the Son of God. It's beautiful to think. Sometimes we make Jesus this stoic figure just sitting up, up very far off, just has no emotions, no feelings. But last time I checked, my Bible tells me that Jesus likes to party. Some of you don't like that. It's okay. I love it. That's something wrong with you. But anyway. And then you go to the second miracle, and then the third, and then the fourth, and then the fifth. They're all beautiful stories. Jesus healing, Jesus doing specific things. But the seventh one. Why is it number seven? What does seven mean? Complete. Whole. It's finished. Nothing else adds on to it. The seventh one is the one I believe is the greatest of all. You see, as much as we try to sugarcoat it, as much as we try to normalize it, death is terrible. See, we get pretty caskets. We put flowers on the caskets. We, we, even, we even lay people to rest in, in nice little areas where there's grass, lilies, and flowers. And people take care of the grass, but at the end of the day, it doesn't mask the pain. The caskets do nothing. That's why you still hear people jumping on their caskets before the person is lowered into the ground. Because death is the ultimate indicator that there is darkness upon the land. Death is the ultimate indicator that there is something wrong. Death is the ultimate indicator that we are a slave to something. Death is it. How many of you have experienced death? Raise your hand if you've experienced death. Some of you, I know that it's been pretty, pretty frequent. Some of you, I know, it was actually just a few weeks ago. Death is terrible. And as much as it's normalized in TV shows and, and music that we listen to, when it strikes at the, our home, it disrupts every aspect of life. Can someone testify with me? It really does. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You can't, you can't go and do your job properly. Your mind is elsewhere. And then the thought, the most agonizing thought possible is I cannot hold this brother's hand again or sister. You have to listen to voicemails. You have to listen to videos on YouTube of them speaking, see their pictures, but it's not the what? It's not the same. Someone testify me, you've experienced that, is it just me? I remember when I lost Ken, he was my friend at my church, Vietnam veteran boy, he was, he was something to behold, man. I remember I got a phone call from him every single day. Brothers and sisters, that's not sometimes a good thing, every single day. I love him to death, boy, man, my man can go. And I remember I, just, I ate at his house, I slept on in his guest room, I mean, we played golf together, and the, I remember I got the phone call from this night. He's gone. I, that messed me up. And in and, and John chapter 11, there's another person that died. The last miracle. The miracle that trumps all other miracles. See, everything else, okay, someone else might be able to do. Remember, like, how Moses approaches Pharaoh, and, like, some of uh, Pharaoh's people were able to do some of the miracles? Cool, you can heal someone, great. You can do that, fine. But you can't resurrect someone from the dead. So John chapter 11 comes. Start with me to your Bibles, John chapter 11. When you got to say amen. If you don't say, wait for me. Okay, no one got it. Everyone got it. Now a certain man, John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick. His name was what, everybody? Of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister, what? It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with hair, whose brother was what? So this is getting personal. And as you study the text and as you study different scholars, this isn't just a random person off the street. This is someone that Jesus actually goes to. Do you have those people in your life when everything's going nuts? You know you can just go to their house. You don't have to give them the phone call. You just open the door. <laughs> Mine is Gus and Lydia. <laughs> I kid you not, this whole week I just walk in now. It's really beautiful and remarkable. Do you have those people? The people that you don't have to talk to them. You can just sit on the couch and pass out. You don't have to ask them, hey, can I use the rest? You don't have to ask them what's in the fridge. You can just go. Do you have those individuals in your life? Well, that's Jesus with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. These are the people that Jesus would go to to get away from everybody else. This is the place where Jesus would go to to find rest for his soul. These are people Jesus loved, and they loved him. They weren't asking Jesus to do this for him, this for him, do this. No, they would just want to simply sit at Jesus' feet and listen to anything and everything. These are the type of 
the people. And that's why the Bible talks about here in John, explaining it a little bit. Let's keep breaking it down. Therefore the sisters said to him, Lord, behold, he whom you what? Is what? I mean, I've gotten messages late in the night that one of you were in the hospital. I, I'm there, right? That's, that's just what we do. Pastor Raymond's there. I know Antonio Cano, Pastor, Pastor Antonio Cano, he does that. A lot of you do that for one another. It's not unheard of to hear that somebody's sick, and the first thing we do is like, oh, he needs chicken noodle soup, right? We just go, right? We're on our way. The text is funny, though. When Jesus heard that, verse 4, he said, this sickness is not unto what? Okay? But for the glory of that the Son of God may be glorified what? Who is it? Interesting. Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister Lazarus. So when he heard that he was what? Everyone say sick. He stayed how many more days? Twenty. <laughs> I just love it. John probably right this. I, I bet he chuckled. <laughs> I'm not joking. This is this is just not what you would expect. You expect Jesus to get up and go, right? It's time to, we got to go now, right? And just run. Especially, I love this person, but he stays for how many more days, everybody? Two more days. And, and the reason why Jesus stays is because this specific thing that's going to happen is going to glorify who first? And glorify the fact that the Son of God is truly one with the Father. So this is going to be the purpose. This is the reason. The miracle is not going to be that Lazarus resurrects. That's not the miracle. The miracle is that people are going to believe in Jesus and who he really is. The miracle is not the fact that God can do this, God can heal you from this, God can set you free. The miracle would be that you actually believe that he can do it. That's the miracle. And so Jesus says two more days, and you know what happens to Lazarus? He would. Dies. And I believe in that shout that though he passed away and though Jesus didn't show up on time, he still had faith in Jesus. Because my Bible tells me those who have died in what? In Christ will be resurrected. And I believe at the moment, as if I were dwindling, as whatever, he sees the light. I don't know what happens. I've never died. Whatever that happens, I believe without a shout out, he was holding fast to the belief that God is able. I believe it. Because the one thing that can stop God from doing anything in your life, you know what it is? Lack of faith. That's it. God can work through a lot of different things. But when you don't believe and you don't want to believe, that's the one thing that can tie God's hands behind his back. Jesus went to his hometown and he couldn't do anything. Why? Because the people didn't believe. And so Lazarus died. Jesus waits. He has a conversation with with uh, the disciples, hey, it's time to go. They're like, Jesus, whoa, we, whoa, I mean, let's not, hey, stop. Because if you go back there, you're going to absolutely what? Die. See, every single time Jesus reveals an aspect of himself, it's like he's signing his death certificate, one letter at a time. Every single time God does one miracle, every time he proclaims the kingdom of God, every time he sets someone free who has been held captive, it's almost like he's just opening the tomb for himself, he's putting the cross up by himself, and he's getting the nails. Every single time. And Thomas knows this. And that's why Thomas says what? If you read in the text, you know your Bible, and I know my Bible. It says, well, <laughs> let's just go with him so we can die this brother really wants to die, well, I'm not leaving his side. Let's just get this on. <laughs> and so Jesus walks. And every step closer in saving Lazarus is one step closer to his execution. Every step. Every time he gets closer and closer to Jerusalem, Jesus knows. And I love that idea. I love that thought. Just to segue for a second, what you're worth. I, I know what you're worth. I've heard the voice of God tell me what you're worth in the last three and a half years. I know exactly what you're worth. You're worth more than silver or gold. You're worth more than you could possibly ever imagine. God has done so many things in your life, and you didn't deserve it. I know for a shadow of doubt. Y'all some sick people. Can I say that? Is that okay? You for real sick. And I'm sick too, right? We're all on the same page. And we didn't deserve it. But I have seen God do amazing things because he thinks you're worth it. I have seen him walk closer and closer, 
figuratively speaking, to the cross for you because he thought you were worth it. And so Jesus finally gets there, and we're introduced to this one lady. Her name is Mary, or Martha, Martha first. What I like about Martha, Martha doesn't wait for Jesus to even show up. She hears about it, and she books it to Jesus right away. She got, she got some problems to deal with, and she needs to have a conversation with the master. Some of you are like that. I appreciate you. Some of you, uh, I'm not going to wait for like this pettiness. I'm going to go directly to you, and we're going to handle this conflict right here, right now. You know who you are. Amen to you. All right? You make me uncomfortable, but it's okay. All right? <laughs> Dr. Pastor Antonio Cano is going to talk about personality types, but we'll keep talking. And she goes to Jesus, and she runs to him, and she says, and she says here, I love this phrase, Lord, if you had been here, my brother, my he wouldn't have died. But even now, listen, I got faith. I know that whatever you ask, God will what? Give you. She got faith. She has problems. And her problems push her not away from Jesus, but towards Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? And Jesus says, your brother will what? And then she says something that, like, every Advent sister probably, probably knows by heart. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I know he'll resurrect in the last days. And like, and, and I know it. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. In the last days when Jesus comes back through the clouds, yes, everything will be fine. He will wipe every tear from my eye. Yeah, I get it. In the last days, though. At the end, God will do it. Not now. God's going to do it later. Right now, I'm going to suffer. Right now, my tears are just going to fall. But later, later, I get it, I get it. I've been to enough prophecy seminars. In the end, God's going to make it good. God's going to make it all right. What I like about this, and this is one of the applications I want to make to each of you, is that when Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life, I like to interpret it like this. That future reality that you hope for is here now. The thing that you're looking forward to, the thing you hope for, the thing that you cannot see, the thing that you are just begging to come so, so quickly, is here right now. The kingdom of God is what? Here. I am taking the future reality and I'm breaking it into the present. That hope of the resurrection, I am the resurrection, the one who stands before you. And I am among you. I'm dwelling with you. I'm building my sanctuary in your heart. And so your tears that are falling, they're not just going to fall and continue falling until I come again. I will wipe your tears right now. I will take care of you today if you would just, what? Believe. So Martha's problems kind of dealt with, right? Jesus moves on. Martha runs back and she tells Mary something very interesting. Something I want to focus on just for a few seconds. Jesus is calling out to you. See, I, I'm, I relate more to Mary. I'm petty. What can I do? You know? I have a fight with my wife. I like to walk off, right? It's just who I am. I can't fight it. It's just me. I'm working on it. I feel more like Mary. I got a problem with Jesus. I don't want to talk to you. I don't, I, I, I'm good. I'll be over here. If you want to talk to me, you can come to me, right? That's kind of my mentality sometimes. I feel like I'll do a little bit with Mary. I do. Mary's probably upset. Jesus could have come. He could have done something, but he chose not to. I don't understand why. I don't. I'm upset. I love Jesus. I, I, I know he could do, but why didn't he? And these thoughts of doubt and confusion and hurt and pain and belief and trust, it's all intertwined. And there Mary's in the house, but then she hears the words from Martha, Jesus is calling after. So many times you read the book of Psalms, I cried out to you, I cried out to you, I'm calling out to you, God. I'm calling. We hear a people calling out to God, but how often have you thought about the fact that God is calling out to you? How often do you focus on the fact that he left the 99 to come after the one? And in this text we see perfectly that Jesus is meeting two different types of personalities. He's meeting Martha, more she's okay with the conflict, she's okay with coming to Jesus, and she's meeting the more passive individual. And he calls after her. He woos after her. And what happens? The Holy Spirit is working on Mary's heart, and she gets up, and she what? 
They think she's going to the grave, but she actually goes to who? Jesus. This is where the story gets really, really good. Mary's there. And then verse 32, if you're with me in your Bible, chapter 11, verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, I would argue, because she had no strength to walk or to stand. Saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not what, everybody? This is one of my favorite parts. I think this just shows the complete humanity of Jesus in this text. Therefore, when Jesus, what? Saw her, what, everybody? And the Jews came, and with her, what, everybody? He groaned in his spirit and was, what? He was troubled. When he saw his child in pain, when he saw the effects that death had on his daughter, he was troubled. When he sees you in agony, as he sees you tossing and turning, as he sees you mourning someone you've lost recently or a while ago, whatever the case may be, he looks at you, he sees you, and in his spirit he groans in what? In pain. He understands your pain. Beautiful. The story gets better. Jesus says, where have you what? Jesus has come to take back the kingdom, yes or no? Uh, everyone, can you tell me yes? Thank you so much. Jesus has come back, come back according to Luke chapter 4. I have come to set free the captives, to give sight to the blind, to restore everything that I've lost. I have come to bring about the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. That's what Jesus claimed he was going to do. And in the book of John, you read of him doing this, and this, and this, and he does it for some miraculous things, but death is the one thing that will define Jesus and set him apart from every other prophet, everybody else. This death, a person that has been asleep for some days now, his skin is rotting, it is literally decaying. This is going to set apart Jesus from everything else. And so Jesus asked, where is that giant you are facing? Where is it? Where is that? Where is the... ...for me and over my child? In the first chapter of John, John invites people to come and what? Everyone say, come and see. One more time, tell your neighbor, come and see. See, Jesus invites people to come and see who he is, what he's all about, where he lives, what he sleeps like, who this individual is, to know his heart. And here in the text, I love it. Mary goes, come and see. Come and see the very thing that has been tormenting you. Come and see the thing that has overcome you. Come and see the very thing that I have no power over and that I cannot control. Come and see, Jesus. Are you able? Jesus goes. And he goes to the grave or to the, to the place where Lazarus was buried. And it says that Jesus wept and he was weeping all the way there. Now remember, the miracle is not that Lazarus resurrected, right? Right? Their miracle is going to be that people would what? Everyone say believe. That's the miracle. That's the thing Jesus wants. More than anything, for you to be able to look at whatever you are facing, to look at the disasters that are before you, to look at the brokenness that is just overwhelming you, and he wants you to be able to look dead in the eyes and say, my God is able. He wants you to have the faith that surpasses all understanding and to and just say from Ephesians 3.20, my God is, exceed, is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than I can ask or think according to the power that worketh what? In me. And Jesus gets to the tomb, roll the what? The stone. Funny thing is, as Lazarus' tomb is stone is rolled away, it seems that Jesus is just saying, roll my tomb, roll my stone. And everyone's saying, Jesus, his body's decaying. It's going to be an awful smell. And Jesus reminds him once again, 
if you would just believe. And I love how Ellen White says this. I love Ellen White. She's amazing. She says, as, she, as he said, Lazarus, come forth. Number one, he says Lazarus specifically because if he were just to say, come forth, all the tombs would be open. Do you know the power that is within the words of God? He can create universes with just the word. So he must, he must restrain himself and just say one name. Because if not, everything that had passed away would have resurrected in that moment. It says, Lazarus come forth. And she says it like this. As people were beholding the face of Jesus, his divinity flashed through his humanity. And they were able to see once and for all, this ain't no ordinary man. This is God himself. And so I realized for the last three and a half years, I've been preaching really one message to you. Funny enough, right? I looked at my sermon. I was like, that's interesting. That's the same thing. Same topic, same topic, same topic. Different story, same topic. I realized that I, I preached a similar thing. And it was just one thing. Repent and believe. That's all I've been preaching the last three and a half years. I didn't preach out there at Central. I preached a good amount. I preached more in Northeast. Sorry, guys. I'm not. I apologize. I preached one thing. Repent and simply believe. Believe in the fact that whatever you are facing, God is able. Believe in the fact that whatever you have lost, God can find. Believe in the fact that whatever has been taken from you, God can restore. Now, if you can, do me the favor one last time. Go to Joel, chapter 2. If you put it on the screen, it's too late. Do it. It should be on the screen. My last one. Chapter 2, verse 24. The book of Joel, it talks about the fact that God sent these locusts because the people were unfaithful. That's why they lost everything. God removed his hand of protection from Israel because they wouldn't walk according to the covenant. They wouldn't come together. They allowed petty arguments amongst each other to consume them until they looked like the people outside of our church. Are you with me? They allowed all these small, insignificant things, minor details about what should be played and what shouldn't be played in the church. They allow these small to be things that this earrings on this woman, but these earrings on this other doesn't matter. They allow these tiny things to accumulate so much that Israel became unfaithful. And they looked worse than the world outside. Can you believe it? And because God loved them so much, he sent locusts. Huh? Like that? A plague that was meant for Egypt, he sent to Israel. Come on, somebody say amen to that. That's some good gospel right there. You may not like it, but it's good gospel. And in doing so, he did it to humble them, to bring them to their knees so that they can finally recognize that they are not able, but that he is able. And in doing so, he says, if you would repent and what? Say and believe everybody. He promises you this. The first floor shall be full of what? And the vats shall overflow with new wine and new what? Next, next verse. He promises you. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. The crawling locusts. The chewing locusts. My great army that I sent you. Jesus says, I'll give it back even better than what you had originally. If you would repent and what? That's my last appeal to each of you guys, to the church here in El Paso, at least the English church in El Paso. Repent and believe. And if you truly do so, you should come together. It will naturally occur. There will be no division among you. And if there is, leave this place and go make it right with that individual. Because your offering is not sufficient if you have a problem with your brother or sister in this place. Did you know that? That's what Jesus says in the book of Matthew. 
If you truly repent and believe and seek Jesus' faith, you will come together as one. Just as a husband and wife are one. Just as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. If you repent and believe. How many of you like to repent and believe this morning? Is that your desire? Then I challenge you. That person that you have a problem with in this building, because I know you do, go talk to them. I dare you. Go allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. Allow the Holy Spirit to actually live in you. You think your theological doctrines and whatnot are going to keep you safe when you have something wrong with the brother and sister? Please stop. If you truly want to see Jesus do amazing things, go make it right. And if it is your desire this morning to repent and believe also, you don't got problems with nobody, but you need to consecrate yourself once again. I invite you to come. Come forward and let the elders, who have the elders in this place, who are the elders? Come up, all the elders, all my elders, please, and Pastor Raymond's elders, please come forward. If it is your desire to repent and believe, I invite you to come forward and ask an elder to lay his hand on you or her lay a hand on you, whichever person you feel most comfortable with, and ask him to pray over you. Concentrate yourself before the Lord. I invite you to come forward. And if you don't feel like you want to come forward, I ask you to stand. And concentrate yourself where you are standing right now in this place. If that is desire, please do so at this time. Amen. Amen. Find an elder and have them pray over you. We have many elders. Let's pray together as the elders pray over you. Father, we have come into this place as one church and one family. And families have a lot of problems, amen. They do. Father, we get into disagreements, we get into issues with one another. But Father, I pray that we speak your faith. I pray that we speak who you are, Lord. And I pray that we repent, which means to turn away. And we believe that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly, more than we can ask or think, because you worship. I invite those who will want to come forward, may they come forward and receive a blessing over an elder. Father, I pray that you listen to our blessings and our prayers. And we pray all this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. If it is your desire to come forward, if not, please have a seat. We're going to do something just then. We're going to give some time for people to give prayers. So you can have a seat if you don't want to come forward. Grab your chair.